automation tools in uh, room six. Now, let's get started. So I'd like to start by giving some definitions on the development of public policy. I'd like to focus on the smaller size of the Complutense University of Madrid. It's a set of uh, goals, decisions, and options that uh, a government uh, uh, makes uh, to solve problems that at a certain moment uh, both the citizens and the government itself may consider a priority. So when we talk about public policy at this in this presentation, we mean those the policy that have to do with the passing laws, decrees, regulations in general. <coughs> in uh, the cycle, as these pu this public policy is generated, we define a problem. That problem leads to formulating alternatives. That is, that if citizens of a uh, govern of or people in government identify a certain problem there must be they must formulate uh, the uh, solutions or alternatives for the solutions and so according to those alternatives there's an adoption of which is the best route or which is the best solution that finally uh, that is finally adopted to solve what had been identified as a problem then that alternative is uh, uh, chose is implemented and then there's an evaluation of uh, the results obtained. And finally, if the results, uh, uh, result evaluation is not positive, if there's no positive feedback, then the cycle should start again. And it is here that some governments somehow identify the problem. And uh, the solution that they identify basically is the creation of a law or a regulation to solve problems. Um, and um, in LACNIC, for a couple, in the last uh, two years, we have developed an initiative where we monitor any initiative that may arise in Latin America and the Caribbean that may have an impact on the basic principles of the internet. That is an open, stable, and secure internet. So this includes uh, the implementation uh, of um, regulations, decisions, etc. So, <clears throat> uh, to monitor this, um, well, not all the regulations are good or bad per se, we have determined a level of critis cr uh, criticality that can be critical, uh, medium, or low, depending on the initiative. Now, focusing on the region, for instance, we see that Central America and the Caribbean between the, the year 2023 and 2024 received about, well, we received about 26 alerts, positive, uh, medium, and low, and critical alerts. Out of the, the critical alerts, for instance, we identified 12 in the region. Later on, I'm going to give you a brief uh, preview, uh, a small summary telling you what they are, focusing countries like Mexico and Nicaragua. As to the uh, topics that haven't been developed for public policy in the internet, there's a high tendency in Central America to develop public policy in uh, the case of data protection, and um, then public policy about uh, artificial intelligence, and finally, cybersecurity. There is no doubt that there are many, many topics that are related with the access, with access, uh, cryptocurrency, and a number of themes that uh, have not been, uh, are not uh, as developed as the uh, three that I mentioned earlier for the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, in the case of Dominican Republic and Trinidad and Tobago, well, they were not uh, painted there. But for 2022, uh, 2023, 2024, Dominic in Dominican Republic, we received uh, 10 alerts between medium and low levels. And uh, for South America, that has a high activity. We receive about 
206 initiatives of Parliament of regulations that we have identified in this initiative, in this internal process of LACNIC. The countries with more activity, for instance, are Colombia with a great number of initiatives, especially on telecommunications. They went through a process where they would bid 5G bands, uh, and uh, Peru, that also has um, many initiatives related to the internet. In this case, for instance, the critical initiatives. We identified some to share with you. In Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Uruguay, Argentina, and Chile. And um, well, the tendency or the uh, topics that are more developed in the region in a as a proportion, they have a higher incidence on uh, data protection, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. Of course, there are other themes uh, of telecommunications. So just as I mentioned, there are some countries that are going through uh, processes where they are updating their national plans to adopt uh, the 5G bands and the uh, their tenders, and so that is why there are many initiatives, many regulatory initiatives that are uh, for uh, the uh, telecommunications. So, in general, for all the Latin America and uh, Caribbean region for 2023 and 2024, we received uh, 242 initiatives in all the region. There are countries where there is a high number of a high amount of uh, regulatory activity in terms of public policy. Well, there are other countries that have no uh, development in that regard whatsoever. So, as we saw at the beginning in the map that give, gave the details of Central America, and um, uh, well, for instance, this is an initiative that we identify as an initiative that has a critical uh, profile and it has to do with a federal initiative for the development of uh, cybersecurity in Mexico. And equally, there is an initiative in, in this in Nicaragua. This has to do with the update of a telecom uh, uh, law. So all of us in our countries have our regulators, our ministries, and in a way, the laws have uh, uh, become obsolete with time, so it is normal for them to be updated on a regular basis. However, these initiatives are taken advantage of, uh, sometimes to promote uh, elements that are not consistent with the basic uh, principles of the Internet. In Colombia, we are monitoring this project that has to do with the uh, guidelines for digital security of uh, children and adolescents that is intended to preserve the data shared by our um, children, adolescents, and youth uh, in the Internet. They establish some guidelines and they block some domains in general. There we are monitoring that specifically for this uh, regulatory framework. In the case of Ecuador, for instance, a law, this is no longer an initiative, but it's a law that has been passed. And in general terms, it strengthens some capacities in terms of cybersecurity. This is absolutely positive. However, the themes that were included in this law are the updates of the protocols. Most of you know that the IPv6 protocols make it possible to better trace the internet transactions, and this law basically includes, they use the term migrating from IPv4 to IPv6, and that is not the reality of implementing or really deploying this protocol. In Peru, last year, for instance, they updated the, regu uh, the regulation on uh, the neutrality of the network. Everybody agrees that the laws, that the, the internet has to be neutral. However, the regulation empowers uh, the regulator to block certain sites 
that are used for activities that are against the law. In this case, for instance, activities uh, with no licenses such as uh, um, sports uh, bets or uh, pirate uh, channels. In the case of Bolivia, for instance, we monitored a precaution, precautionary um, measure. A judge blocked an app that was called Maristeve, um, uh, hosted in some domains, that, uh, and basically the judge ordered blocking these domains together with some IP blocks. This is not an initiative, it's not a law, but it's a precaution, uh, an action that was adopted by a judge legally. As to Paraguay, for instance, I wanted, I wanted to share this initiative with uh, some guidelines for the uh, protection of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, later on, we are going to see many elements that are debated in the region or initiatives that are debated in the region that uh, have some relation with uh, cybersecurity. It seemed uh, interesting to share it in Paraguay. This is an issue that has been uh, debated. And in the case of Chile, there's a draft, uh, there's a bill that develops and regulates the online platforms in that country, there are some local guidelines banning um, any gambles and uh, uh, trying to correct the topic. As we pointed out at the beginning, uh, we identified the topic and the solution that was uh, uh, designed in the development of the uh, public policy is blocking these sites, uh, these gambling sites. In the case of Argentina, last year, they ordered uh, blocking and seizing a web, a web domain. In this case, they identify a web domain that uh, uh, broadcasted contents of uh, uh, TV and uh, sports events. And a prosecutor in Argentina um, adopted some pre uh, precaution uh, measures, uh, uh, closing a domain because of this. And finally, in the case of Uruguay, we well, we have also been monitoring an initiative that has to do, for instance, with uh, the protection of the rights of uh, children, adolescents, and adolescents in digital environments, prim where they promote the elimination and the moderation of some contents that are published online. So, and likewise, uh, at the same time, not only are we paying attention to what's happening in the region in uh, the adoption of laws, etc., but uh, LACNIC also monitors the recommendations arising from ITU, the International Telecommunications Un Union. I, for instance, I uh, echoed, I, I, I wanted to echo the next uh, global uh, standardization uh, um, uh, uh, conference, uh, the ITU WTSA, where they are going to address uh, uh, this uh, at a global level. So uh, we have monitored the, the, uh, the work, uh, the preparedness work uh, of uh, OAS, specifically CTEL, the int um, the uh, uh, that uh, is in charge of the uh, Central American uh, proposals and uh, the. Uh, the draft laws once approved, uh, they are considered by the global forum in the case of ITU. So in terms of cybersecurity, as I had uh, mentioned earlier, there is a large number of initiatives that are developed in terms of cybersecurity for 2023-2024. There were about 28 initiatives. This was 12% of the total initiatives that uh, we monitored. These have to do, for instance, with the creation of C-certs, 
creation of procedures for the management of uh, digital security themes, uh, developing national digital security uh, strategies, or the uh, creation of some uh, cybernetic uh, cyber crime. Of course, there's a lot that one could say about this topic, but we wanted to discuss cybersecurity in that, uh, and Kevin will give you uh, a, a bit more details about cybersecurity. Go ahead, Kevin. Hello. Well, thank you, Cesar. Now, I'm going to continue in English. Uh, speaking of the Budapest Convention and the second protocol of the Budapest Convention. The Budapest Convention is the foremost uh, international legal instrument that exists uh, to work on cybercrime. It presents two things. It's a global standard, and by global standard, it means that it actually uh, encapsulates a number of the best practices um, that prosecutors would need um, in looking at collecting electronic evidence and conducting uh, cyber investigations and coming up to prosecutions. Um, but it's also what you would consider a global standard. Um, this convention um, started within the Council of Europe in 2001. There was a convention report and an expository note that was approved by a Council of Ministers. It was open for signature from 2001 and it came into effect in 2004. And that's an error there. It's supposed to be desde 2004. Um, so with this um, main instrument in mind, we are now at a point where there are 72 signatories, of which 26 are not members of the Council of Europe. Um, so just for us to get an understanding as to how this convention is structured, this is the main convention that includes on the one hand um, classification of certain behaviors online, uh, which we will consider by law cyber crimes. Um, of those behaviors, there are four main types. You will have, for instance, um, issues relating to um, data, um, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. You have issues that are computer related and computer systems. You have as well uh, content related issues um, for which um, the main one that is captured um, under the Budapest Convention would be child pornography or uh, child sexual abuse materials. And then we will have as well infringements to copyright, uh, which is also penalized under the convention. So uh, this penalization is very important, um, and that would have referred to the points that are made um, in the previous slide about initiatives in the region, um, simply because without there being an adequate penalization at law, of these behaviors, there's little that can be done um, in terms of ensuring the complete cycle of justice. Um, and that is important to go beyond what we can do at the level of applying technical standards and beyond the work of um, CSIRTs, for example. So the Budapest Convention, um, in the first instance, will seek to harmonize uh, criminal law and provide this classification of cyber crimes. Um, it also establishes uh, pr uh, uh, pr pr procedure law um, to investigate um, and to give uh, particular powers to law enforcement for, those in for that investigation. Uh, so for instance, under procedural law, we we'll look at um, specific categories of data and specific activities that are uh, allowed or provided for to authorize persons by competent authorities, and these may include um, expedited preservation of stored data, expedited preservation, partial disclosure of data tra traffic data, um, production orders, uh, seizure, search and seizure of computer data, real-time collection of traffic data, interception of content data. Um, and why is any of this important? It's important because given that the grand majority of cyber crimes and cyber incidences that we see have a transnational nature, um, it, one jurisdiction needs to establish that this is criminal 
um, and on, well, all jurisdictions through which a cyber crime occurs need to establish that this is criminal, um, that the level of criminalization is comparable in order for there to have any sort of cooperation across uh, national lines. Um, the third part of the Budapest Convention would be uh, the creation of an agile framework uh, that allows for international cooperation. So uh, specifically as it relates to the collection of digital evidence, um, but there's also, for instance, outside of legal um, instruments themselves, um, the creation of a 24-7 cooperation network that significantly streamlines um, cooperation with authorities uh, for, for various aspects of a cyber investigation. So that sounds all well and good, but what has happened? So this is a convention that was created in 2001. And in fact, the matter is that after the creation of the convention, there were still many problems that exist and other problems that weren't necessarily anticipated. Um, one of which would have been that the business models on the internet have become a lot more cross-border. Uh, so you could imagine in 2001, the whole idea of contracting cloud services, your Google services, or any type of service of that nature would have been um, part of the main policy context of the day in 2001, and therefore um, it's a lot more cross-border now. Um, and therefore, the location of electronic evidence is, again, very scattered because of cloud services and other types of services it's scattered across various jurisdictions. You have that the volume and the complexity of cyber crimes um, has increased significantly since then. Um, so we would have considered, for instance, for the CIA, the data access um, issues such as simple hacking and DDoS would have been one thing. Um, but um, over the last years, we've been hearing much, much more about the threat of ransomware and um, attacks that are fueled by artificial intelligence. So that explains a bit of the need to have something that's a bit more modern. And of course, um, under the traditional um, legal assistance mechanisms, uh, we would have had uh, significant delays in having uh, cooperation from authorities of one jurisdiction to the other. So whereas um, initially you would have seen expedited uh, preservation requests for stored data and the like, um, if left up to the existing uh, legal assistance frameworks outside of the Budapest Convention, legal assistance takes anywhere upwards of eight months, and this is totally ineffective for anything that deals with digital evidence. Uh, within the Budapest Convention, there are particular carve-outs there, but there are still, there's still a very low level of prosecution, of, of, well, initiation of cyber investigations and prosecutions um, because quite simply the, the authorities do not have um, the required tools to do uh, what is needed. So with this second convention, which is still, um, still open, um, we see now that this convention allows, for instance, direct requests uh, to registrars or from to registration information for domain names uh, from a competent authority in one jurisdiction uh, to a service provider in another jurisdiction, both being party to the second protocol. Um, this direct cooperation is also novel in a sense um, because it's also useful to get subscriber information from an authority of one jurisdiction to a service provider in another jurisdiction. Um, it looks at um, getting that information in a much more efficient way and through the cooperation of governments. Um, it also creates provisions for emergency cooperation in particular instances. It allows for teams of investigators from various jurisdictions to work together. Um, there's video conferencing both at the level of investigations and also at the level of of prosecutions in terms of submission of electronic evidence. And um, as uh, with the main convention, um, there is a safeguard for human rights um, included within the second protocol. So for the first protocol, just to get an idea, not the first protocol, sorry, for the main Budapest convention, uh, we have 72 signatories, 26 are not COE members. Within the region, we have nine 
sing the trees in Latin America and the Caribbean, and four other countries that have been invited to sign, making a total of 13 countries who are implicated by the Budapest Convention. Uh, now, what we are seeing with the second protocol is that you have, in effect, a number of countries that have signed, including Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic. Um, so they have signed the second protocol for expedited cooperation. That would have a significant impact, uh, I would say, on operations or any service provider in these regions. But there is, in practice, a lag between the signing of a protocol and then the ratification of that protocol, which would then lead to possible creation of new laws, new directives that will have to be implemented and will have an impact on service providers within these territories. Um, so this is a quick snapshot of this um, issue in a nutshell. Uh, what this means is that there are going to be further obligations. There are, for instance, um, obligations for there to be uh, the disclosure of uh, subscriber information and the disclosure of traffic data within uh, specified periods of time. Um, so, for instance, for subscriber information from a requesting party, um, one must provide that disclosure within 20 days, for traffic data within 45 days. Fortunately, the convention allows for parties who are being uh, solicited to actually give a reason for not complying, but if you do not comply, that has to be a legitimate reason um, to not be uh, aiding or abetting within the commission of a crime. And this is happening in our region. It's trying to move the mark from having a very low level of investigations and prosecutions to having something that is much more effective and to complete the cycle of justice for cyber issues. And with that, I'll hand back over to Cesar. Gracias, Kevo. Thank you, Kevin. So we can draw conclusions from here based on the different topics that we have shared with you on the regulatory update. And one is that the public policy formulation is no easy task. This is a complex task which requires a thorough approach regarding the benefit of the public interest in order to maximize the collective well-being. It is in this sense that we have to take into account some other considerations. For example, diversity of structures, political values, and the frameworks um, present in each country. As regards the precautionary measures in the presentation, we referred to precautionary measures issued by some of the judges in the regions, and these are issued by these authorities. These arise as a result of a legal process through the due process. This is reported, investigated, and a precautionary measure is issued. Some of these precautionary measures can affect some other human and civil rights, for example, freedom of expression, etc. In the context of the internet, although decision making might seem to be something simple that is not so straightforward, this then leads to collaboration between the multiple stakeholders, the public sector, the government, the civil society, the academia, should all have an active role throughout the decision-making process regarding the public policies that have to do with the internet. And finally, it is essential that the decision-makers or those who create these public policies should also consider the nature that we have always prevented and promoted in these forums, namely that this should be an open, stable, and secure internet nature. So 
In this sense, the actions taken by the public policymakers should be in line with national and regional strategies in the scope of the internet. In this case, is the digital scope. So far, this was a brief update on the regulatory issues. The floor is open in case you have any questions. There are no questions. I think there are no questions in the chat. So thank you very much, and we will be around.